Thank you very much. As uh, you turn in your Bibles to 1 John and chapter 1, uh, allow me to uh, just quickly add two things to what I mentioned earlier concerning uh, the African Christian University that I may have taken for granted. One is that uh, it's in Zambia and not Zimbabwe. Uh, I say that because there are many times I share across the US and when someone comes to talk to me afterwards, they say Zimbabwe. And I don't blame anyone. It's simply because uh, Zimbabwe is our more famous neighbor. Uh, Zambia is a very quiet country, hardly ever in the news, for which we are grateful. <laughs> so, because usually any news is bad news. And the Lord, for some gracious reason that we don't know of, seems to have spared Zambia from so much strife. The other bit is, uh, I should have mentioned, a, a famous name here that often connects the African Christian University to Americans is our brother Vodi Bokam, who came to us in 2015 to help us set up the seminary uh, part of the university and has continued uh, with us. This is now his eighth year. He's now stepped down as dean of the School of Divinity, and that's another role that has been placed on my shoulders, but it still remains with us uh, in, in Zambia. So that, I hope, will also connect uh, the dots, as most of you know, that is somewhere in Africa. Is actually a stone's throw away from, uh, from where I live. In fact, not too long ago, somebody came to visit me in the office and asked me if I knew Vodi Bokam. And I said his office is across the corridor from here. His eyes went like that. <laughs> he stood up, went and checked, came back, and it's like he had seen a ghost. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, yeah, he does work across the corridor from my office. Let's turn to First John. It's uh, a topic that we have been considering this uh, last few days, and it's related to the subject of communion with God. I'd like to begin by saying that uh, the highest level of interaction that a soul can ever engage in is that of communing with the Creator Himself, God. Life was like that in Eden before the fall, and hence we read somewhere in Genesis chapter 3 that in the cool of the evening, the Lord God came in order to commune with Adam and Eve. But because sin had at that time entered into the world, Adam and Eve ran away from the Lord God. That picture is wonderful, especially because of the the statement in the cool of the evening, speaking something of uh, uh, an atmosphere of, of love, an atmosphere that speaks in terms of um, endearment, that this is now lovers coming together at the end of the day in order to just enjoy their time together after a day's labors. That's the kind of communion and fellowship picture that is presented to us in the, the Bible at its very commencement. And it is one that really speaks about why God created the universe. It was to display his splendor, to show forth 
his glory, to reveal himself. And one aspect of this great God of the universe is that he is a communicating God. He is one that communes, and that's one reason why he is revealed as a God who is one and three at the same time. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternal fellowship, never needing anything outside himself, because within the Godhead, all that is met. Now, it's not just Christianity that speaks in those terms. False religions tend to, to feel something of the vacuum that is there in humanity for this reality that the soul seeks to reach out to the divine being. Sadly, all except the Christian faith points to the way in which this communion, this fellowship is to be realized. And it is this, that in all the religions of the world, sorry, all the religions of the world, it's human beings seeking to reach out to this God. It's absolutely impossible. In the Christian faith, it is God reaching out to us as fallen human beings who are absolutely lost. God bridges that gap, comes to us in the person of his Son. And so as we read 1 John, from which we, we had the assurance of um, sins forgiven, you can't miss the fact that John commences with the coming of God in the person of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. A savior that was not sort of a mystical spirit, but he walked on earth. We could see him. We could talk to him. We could touch him the way in which we do with fellow human beings. All so that this aspect of fellowship and communion might be realized. I'll read the first four verses before we come into the actual text that we are looking at, in order for us to, to capture something of this, John was writing in order to counter the era of Gnosticism that was there in his own day. Gnostics were claiming to have some mystical relationship with God that was unique to themselves. And John is saying, no, any relationship with this God, any fellowship comes through knowing Christ. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship, may have koinonia, may have communion with us. And indeed, our fellowship, our communion is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, we are the ones 
who have communion with God. Well, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. In other words, we, we want our joy and your joy to be found in this communion, in this fellowship that we have come to know and experience this communion with God himself. Well, that's where John begins. He begins by telling us that, in fact, we have found this communion with God. But it is because God has found us in the person of his son who has come into this world and we actually had this fellowship with him while he was here below. And it is one that we want you to participate in. And upon Starting on that note, John goes on to say in the text that we are looking at, verse 5 to verse 7, this is the message we have heard from him. That is, this same Jesus whom we saw and heard and touched and had fellowship with. And we are now proclaimers of his message to you. We are simply passing on this message that he left us with. We are not individuals that are putting into place our own views upon navel gazing on some little anthill so that you may now follow us as some mystical teacher. We are simply individuals that heard from him and we are passing this information to you. And what is that? That God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship or communion with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. There are three truths about communion with God that John elaborates here in verse 5 to verse 7, that I want us to meditate on briefly this morning. First of all, it is the essential nature of God. The essential nature of God. John puts it this way, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I'm pretty sure as you're sitting there, like myself, you begin to wonder, what is it that John has in mind? John is a very unique author, and that's one reason why even his gospel stands out from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He has this tendency of uh, using picture language, using concrete terms in order to bring out uh, truths that would otherwise be difficult to, to comprehend. And in this particular case, he, he says God is light. There, there must be some attributes or characteristics of light that John specifically wants to grasp and make evident to to all of us that this is the way God is. Later on, he, he speaks in these terms. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light. So it's not just light. God is light, but God is in the light. There, there's something about this light that says to us, this is the kind of God they are 
is. I want to suggest three attributes of light that you would have in mind, and please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 to bring those attributes out. I'll quickly give them to you. Goodness, morality, and truth. Goodness, morality, and truth. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9. Let me begin with verse 7. Therefore, do not become partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Again, you can't miss that aspect. First of all, you are light and then walk as those who are in the light, which is basically the way John had put it earlier. He is light, this God, and he is in the light. But thankfully, Paul opens up that word light by putting it this way in verse 9. For the fruit of light is found in all that which is good and right and true. That which is good and right and true. Now, for the purposes of my message, I will begin with the last and make our way to the first. We'll begin, therefore, with truth and then go on to that which is right or righteous and then finally that which is good. When we think in terms of light, the aspect of truth is obvious. If this room was in complete darkness, I could easily say to you that I am wearing a navy blue suit. You wouldn't know. You would have to just believe me and hope that I am truthful. However, once the light has been turned on, you know the truth. You are not at anybody's mercy. You are able to see things as they really are. That's the God who is in heaven. When he communicates to us, he communicates reality. He communicates the truth. He's given us his word, for instance, trust me, beyond all the philosophers of this world, here you have concrete truth. You can base your entire life on this. You can base your entire future on this. You can base your entire eternity on this. Because the God who has given us his revelation is one who is truth itself. That's the first aspect that is brought out concerning this God. He is truth. But also, he is truthful. He's a God of integrity. That which he reveals of himself, you can trust that that is reliable enough about who he himself is really is. I'll come back to that aspect in a few minutes. But let's quickly go on to the second part of truth, rather light, and it is in terms of that which is right or righteous. And in a sense, I don't need to open that up because many of us, when we think in terms of light, God is light, we do think in terms of his holiness. And it's true. That's the God who is there. He is worshipped in heaven as holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We must never ever be deceived into thinking that the God who is there is one who, to whom issues of righteousness don't matter. They do. That's the God who is there. He is a morally 
pure being. In fact, as this statement says, in whom there is no darkness, the point is the God who is there, there is absolutely no moral defilement. Zero with respect to this God. And then thirdly and lastly, it is the aspect of goodness. That's something we don't normally think about when we are thinking in terms of light. And yet, that's still very, very true. You notice it here in that when um, Paul speaks about light, in fact, it's the very first attribute he speaks about. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good. We take it for granted, but creation rejoices when it is morning, when the sun rises, birds sing. There is health that comes to our bodies by simply being in the light. Light brings freshness. It brings goodness. It brings health. It brings joy. And I can continue multiplying all these. It is the source of growth and progress and everything else that we can think about. Light represents goodness. We can say that about God as well. That in the midst of all the trials we might have in this world, the difficulties that we might be going through, there's one thing we must never doubt. That seated on the throne of the universe is a heart of love. And if you ever doubt that, take a trip to Calvary and see God's own son taking our place. Why? Because he has loved us. The most famous verse in the whole Bible is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God is good. There is no other that is good but God. All goodness comes from him. Many years ago, soon after my conversion, I stumbled across screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis. And in one of them, the uncle devil speaking to Wormwood, his nephew, nephew devil, was saying that the greatest challenge they have in hell is to find the real explanation behind the claimed benevolence of God. That it can't be true. Why should he love these mortal creatures? There must be some other explanation. The day we discover the secret, we would have defeated the enemy. Well, up to now, they are still trying to discover that secret. Never will, because it is true. He is good, and he is infinitely loving. Well, John is bringing out this fact that this is the God who is there. And I think it's, it's only right that he should begin there, because he, this is the God with whom we want to relate. So surely we should know the kind of God who is there before we can say to ourselves, okay, so this is the way in which I should relate to him. And he is saying, this is the truth that has been shared to us with such clarity that we know 
that whoever claims to have some kind of communion with God, this is where he needs to begin with and um, from. And it is this, that God is light. He's truth, moral righteousness, and good. Let me ask, is that the God you worship? Is that the God that you claim to know? Do you respect those attributes of this divine being when you are saying that this is the God you relate to? Because I want to suggest to you that if that's not the God that you have in mind, then most likely you worship an idol a figment of your own imagination. And one day, you will discover that what you have in your hands is a lie. But it may be too late. So let me plead with you that in all your processing of the reality of this sovereign being who knows no beginning whatsoever, who has created the entire universe and who beckons you into a relationship with himself, never lose sight of this. God is light. But secondly, this is the one that we now speak about coming into fellowship with. When we claim to be Christians, and this is what he says there, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There is nothing of a gray area with respect to this God. And here it is. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. At the beginning of uh, this verse, verse uh, 6, we begin quite a number of if clauses that take us all the way to the end of uh, John chapter 1, and in fact all the way into First John chapter 2, and verse 1. They are conditional clauses. And basically they are meant to, to challenge us to reason and make appropriate conclusions. Conclusions upon which we need to change the way we think, change the way we act. Let me quickly walk you through them, and then we'll come back to this first one and the second one as well. This uh, six, as we've said, number one, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, this is the truth. We lie, and we don't practice the truth. Number two, which we'll look at again to the, together. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, this is the implication, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. Number three, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Number four, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number five, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his truth is not in us. And lastly, number six, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. All of them are simply challenging us, saying one plus one is two. It's never three. 
It's never four. It's two. We are reasonable creatures. We should be able to do our math. And that's all he's saying here. Face the consequences. If A is true and you are functioning with B, I want to assure you that C is inevitable. Let's look at the first two with respect to what we are dealing with in the first part of this letter, which is communion with God. Before we plunge into that, let's just pause and say what are we talking about when we're speaking about communion with God. We went back to the beginning of human history and we saw that there was a relationship between Adam and Eve on one hand and God on the other. A genuine relationship. A relationship in which there was conversation that was happening between the two. A relationship in which there was congenial or warm relationships between them. That they, they looked forward to being together. It was a relationship also of partnership, which is a deeper meaning to the word koinonia that we often lose with the English word fellowship. God was able to call Adam and say to him, here is work that I have given you. And I'm giving you a partner that you should work with. And consequently, he would come at the cool of the evening. The work is done. Let's sit together. Let's talk about how the work has been. Partnership as well in the midst of this. There is fulfillment. There is joy. There is peace. There is unity. All those attributes make up this wonderful statement or word, communion. But this time, it is a vertical relationship. It is God who has come down to us, and he is saying, relate to me and find in me your all in all. Your full satisfaction. Draw your everything from me, even as you respond to me in thanksgiving and gratitude for all that I have consequently blessed you with. And not just thanksgiving, but ultimately worship, rendering to me my worth as I reveal that to you. Communion with God. Lord Jesus Christ summed it up this way in John 17, verse 1 and 2. This is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This experiential knowledge, not just knowledge in the brain, doctrinal that's been passed on to you, but that they might know you, that there might be a real relationship between these creatures that at one time totally lost that relationship with you, the living God. in communion, in fellowship, having been reconciled to him. He says that's what eternal life is. In other words, that communion begins now, here on earth, but it will be indescribably infinite and blessed when we are translated into eternity. 
when we are in his eternal presence. There will be the complete satisfaction that we've begun to know now here on earth. Communion with God. Before a person is converted, Christianity is a kind of hell insurance policy. That's all it is. It's, it's the way to escape going to hell. That's all you're thinking about. So I have to go to church, I have to read my Bible, I have to pray, I have to be good, I have to be this and that, so that I don't go to hell. But if you are truly converted, that's the lowest rung of the ladder. It's the lowest rung. Your, your greatest joy is to be with him. That's the greatest joy. This communion with the living God. You, you love him. You, you walk with him. You talk with him. You serve him. You worship him. You draw all your fullness from him. He is your summum bonum, your highest good. That's one reason why I cannot understand a Christian who says, oh, yesterday I was bored. Bored? Bored? Why? Well, you know, everybody was gone. I was just alone. Alone? What happened? <laughs> you can't be alone if you're a Christian. You are with your most blessed companion. You want to say to everybody, yes, please, go, 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 go. You find me here because I am in communion with God. And I can't wait to finally be in his presence forevermore. Now, with that quick compendium of uh, uh, communion, John here is now telling us that Birds of a feather flock together. Simple. Birds of a feather flock together. You cannot claim to be in this communion with God if you are not as he is. One plus one is equal to two. Let's quickly read what he says there. If we say we have fellowship or communion with him, while we walk in darkness, and walking there has to do with a, a general, average kind of life. But that's the way you normally live. While you walk in darkness, he is saying you are lying. We lie and do not practice the truth. Let's try and quickly summarize it this way. Darkness, in this case, would be the opposite of light. That's really what he has in mind. And again, walking through those three characteristics, first of all, he is saying that you don't know the truth, and secondly, you are not truthful. In other words, you are hypocritical. He says, no, if that's your life, you are not walking in fellowship with God. Number two, morality, holiness. If you are deliberately continuing stubbornly in sin and you know it, and then you are claiming to have fellowship with God, you're only cheating yourself. Because God 
cannot be in that situation, and you know it. Number three, which we often don't think about, is this. If you are a source of gloom and misery, instead of love and goodness, then you are not having fellowship with God. Let me open that one up just a little more. Because we have individuals who claim to be Christians, but who seem to thrive at making other people's lives miserable. Always wanting to rub people the wrong way. Never happy when other people are happy. In the marriage, the spouse is miserable. Miserable but still wanting to come to church and lead Bible study and preach and teach and, and lead the prayer meeting and, and everything else when, when the spouse and the children are disgusted with the way in which they are being treated. That's not Christianity, friends. It's not. The true Christian faith is one of genuine love and care and tenderness and goodness that causes those flowers that have closed in to, to begin to open up because of the rays of health that are coming from them. And it's something that we need to recognize as an attribute. You, you cannot be making other people's lives miserable and then claiming you are having fellowship with God. He is light. You must be light as well. So that's the first thing that he deals with here, the implication with respect to our fellowship with God. It must be showing something of his attribute too. But secondly, it is the implication where we in fact are like him. Let's quickly get there. Time is not with us. This is the way he puts it. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the next statement is a little surprising. But if you really think about it, it is not. He says that we have fellowship with one another. You would have thought you would say we have fellowship with God, communion with God. But he says that's a taken. We have fellowship with one another. And then we also have fellowship with God in the sense that he's the blood of Jesus' son cleanses us from all sin. Let me quickly put it this way. That, remember, light is not just about truth and righteousness. It's also about goodness. It's also about goodness. So if you are truly walking in the light, your life is not just with communion with God, it's also in communion with God's people. On the vertical plane, rather horizontal plane. Why? Because of this aspect, number one, of not just truth, but truthfulness, integrity. You are what you really are. You come through as you are. And if you've got genuine struggles in your spiritual life, you confide among 
the inner circle of fellow believers. You are the real thing. Number two, there is a genuine desire for holiness, for godliness. A genuine desire there. After all, you're trying to be like him. Other believers are also trying to be like him. What's the fruit of that? Fellowship. Fellowship. You are enriching one another's lives in that way. And then thirdly and lastly, it's goodness. You're seeking to love others practically. They're also seeking to love you practically. What's the fruit of that? Fellowship. Communion. Which the world knows absolutely nothing about. Absolutely nothing. It's found among the people of God. And the blessing from heaven is this. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Why? Because as we heard earlier on, we are not deceiving ourselves. We're not claiming I have no sin. Instead, we are confessing our sin. And consequently, God, who is faithful and just, forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's true fellowship with God. True communion with God. Let me apply it this way, especially for those of us who are couples. The one person who knows whether you really have fellowship with God is your spouse. Trust me. You can pretend in church, just like we all put on our best clothing, well, at least in Africa. We all come in suits and the best dresses. When we come to church, we've got Sunday clothing. We can all put on our best behavior and look like angels on a Sunday. So spouse at home who knows that he is someone who's walking with God. Should we use that test on all of us here? Is there that integrity and openness at home? Is there that real Jealousy for a holy life at home? Is there genuine love for those whose mistakes we see every day at home? Then when we come here, yes, we can have fellowship and communion with others and fellowship and communion with God, and especially around his table, because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What a challenge this must have been to Gnostic teachers. Because John is insisting we cannot just manufacture another form of communion with God. We can't. The real thing is in the scriptures. And may God help each one of us to be real Christians in real fellowship with the living. And this is a fruit, as I close, of the Jesus that came on earth. Remember where John began. We've seen him. We've heard him. We've touched him. This eternal life, he was manifested to us. 
In other words, if, as I've come to the end of my message, you have been caught on the wrong foot, I'm not asking you to simply polish up your life and try again. I'm saying, go to the Savior. Go to Jesus Christ, who has been sent down from heaven. Say to him, I have missed the turn here. Lord, give me a fresh beginning. By your Holy Spirit, deal with me from the inside. Make me the real thing that I may have communion with you here below. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, real communion here below that will not only be vertical, but it will spill over into the lives of the saints. And that when we all get to heaven, we will now drink in that full flow of communion with God together to levels that we never know here below. But Lord, begin with me now. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, help us not to be satisfied with the counterfeit, with that which is not the genuine article. Help us to be the real thing, the real deal, a people that have come to know salvation through Jesus Christ, a people in communion with the Father and with his Son, a people that find their joy in communion with one another as well. Oh, God of heaven, thank you for this inestimable privilege of fellowship with yourself. But, oh, Lord, may we not abuse it. May we not miss it. May we enter into it with all its full implications. It's for Christ's name that we pray. Amen.